Tyson, welcome to the podcast. What's going on, man? Good to have you on. Hello. Yeah, thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah, I'm stoked to have you a part of the new season. Uh, this is the third person I think I've had on from Zora. I had Latasha on a couple seasons back and then Eric Ripple um, last season and now you. You know, it's funny. Um, our audiences overlap, which is super interesting. So I noticed that when we record episodes or whenever I have someone from Zora, it actually does exceptionally better than other episodes for whatever reason. Um, yeah, I saw the stats that you sent over, and I, I'm trying to figure out what the exact like overlap is of mint listeners to Zora users. It's pretty crazy. I didn't know it was that that big. Yeah, yeah. So I give out a lot of like free NFTs to my listeners um, every single season, and a lot of them really also enjoy collecting on Zora, which is which is really cool. So now I'm trying to Love figure that. out like how can I how can I use like more of these like like these data points to sort of like find better guests and find better sponsors. So we're experimenting with you on now, you know? I so we'll it. see how that goes. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right. So beyond exchanging a few words in your office in New York, I know very little about you and I'm going into this episode like pretty blind, which I'm actually I'm I'm happy about. That's a good thing, okay? Perfect. You also keep a very like low profile online, so there's not much for me to research or <laughs> or find. I came across your LinkedIn profile, and it's the funniest profile I think I've come across ever. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I've been doing these little covert online ops of just like completely obscuring myself as much as I possibly can. I'm it's glad great. to hear that's working. <laughs> it's great. Okay, so before we like get into like the deep, deep questions, I think a good place to start is trying things a little bit different for this episode. Okay, I want to start with asking you about eight questions. Uh, that I want you to answer quickly, okay? And this is just going to help sure. me better understand who you are, okay? So question number one, what kind of music do you listen to when you work? Oh, man, uh, a little bit of everything at this point. Um, we have Mikhail from Zora who sent me like insane playlists almost weekly okay. now. So I've just been getting my music directly curated by him. It's been great. Is there is there a song that comes to mind? Um. I'm on an Aphex Twin kick right now, which okay. is almost memeable at this point, but it's been the deep working music for me lately. All right. All right. Favorite food? Favorite food? I am on a taco kick right now, which sucks moving from California to New York, but here okay. I am. Okay. All right. Do you read books? I read a lot of books. Yeah. Yeah. Favorite ones? Um, I think for... Fiction, anything by, I'm going to say his name so badly, but uh, Haruka and Murakami, um, or Haru, yeah, I think that's how you say it. Um, okay. And then all sorts of nonfiction, anything like weird history. I'm reading one about the history of the New York subway right now. It's pretty good, actually. Mm, interesting. Okay. What, what really makes you angry? I feel like I don't get angry. I was just talking about this yesterday. I like, usually will just like completely withdraw and not get angry and then almost ghost people instead, which is probably worse, but here I am. Okay. I also noticed that you're wearing uh what is it, a US open hat, so I guess you're into sports. Uh yeah, I actually stole this hat, so I'm a bit of an imposter right now. But it's happening this week, so might be going. Okay, do you have a do you have a favorite sports team? I actually don't. I think I did growing up, but it's just been so hard to keep up. It almost feels like it, yeah, it hurts me now to have to watch sports okay. and try to catch up to everything. Okay, okay. Um, are you usually early or late? Very late. Like, this is early for me, and we're recording at 2 in the afternoon. <laughs> <at> that, <so. laughs> okay. All right. I know you're from British Columbia originally, but is there a place you'd rather be from? No. Honestly, I I, I would like to move back there at some point. It is oh, an incredible okay. place. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But, Actually, there, there's two more. Okay. What would you rate 10 out of 10? Ooh. That's so hard. Wow, uh, this just came up because I've literally just been eating it, but like a good, like handheld fruit. That's just like uh, uh, the perfect amount a of hand, crunch. A like, handheld fruit, okay. Yeah, it can't be something you have to cut up or something you have to like pick at. It's just like, it has to be fitting perfectly in the palm of your hand and you can have <laughs> okay. that good crunch. I literally just All ate right. a fruit and I just thought of that right now. <laughs> okay. Uh, and <laughs> last but not least, your favorite meme or favorite memes? Um, honestly, the word meme is the perfect meme. Okay. Like, All right. The way that you can memify the word meme is great. 
All right. Okay, great. So I think that's that's a good start. That actually gives me a good idea, uh, or at least a better idea of who you are, things I would never really find online. Um, so let's let's kind of transition into <laughs> the deeper questions. Okay, so we said you're from British Columbia. Uh, I'm curious, though, but growing up there, how did that sort of affect like who you are today as a CTO at Zora? Yeah, I don't know. I think it's really strange for me because growing up, I grew up in the middle of British Columbia, like basically nowhere. Um, and have been like continuously moving to bigger and bigger cities. Um, I think just like the change of having to like deal with almost like the the loneliness when you're like deep in thoughts on random like directions or places to be going. It's like kind of nice. And I like I actually like miss going back home to these like quiet places to just like separate myself from the kind of chaos that happens, especially living in New York. It's a uh, very loud and energetic city. So being able to like separate myself into quieter places is always nice. Mm. Would you say moving so much sort of made you more introverted or extroverted over the years? I think I started super introverted, like coming from a really small town to going to much bigger places was kind of a shock for me. Um, but I think it's starting to change now, feeling a little bit more extroverted. Now when I go back to small towns, I feel like I'm extra introver extra extroverted. Mm. Okay, okay. So you live in New York. Right, that's where you're at. Where are you, are you in Brooklyn? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Brooklyn. Okay. Um, I know New York has a really big crypto scene. Uh, what is your start into Web3? What did that look like? So it actually started when I was in college, just talking to a friend who was, this was about 2016, I think. Um, a friend was kind of talking to me about this like hypothetical scenario of a world computer where like kind of everyone shares the same resources and you can see what everyone is up to and what they're all doing. Um, and how that like might affect the, like the culture uh, or character of how people do things online. And obviously what he was talking about at the time was Ethereum. And it was just really compelling to me, this idea that if everyone's sharing the same system or the same, same resources together, there's all these new incentive mechanisms that are going to be created, um, or no one's acting in like a, you know, zero sum game. It's very positive sum because what you do, it directly affects other people around you. Um, so basically from that conversation, I dropped everything, quit my job, dropped out of college for a little bit, moved down to San Francisco, um, started working at Coinbase because I was kind of the only Web3 company I knew of or had heard of at the time. And um, yeah, from there, it just never looked back. Did you have any skepticism sort of uh, when you heard about like this world computer? Uh, honestly, no, I was... It was seemed very dreamy and like very, yeah, probably too good to be true. But at the same time, I was working at like a healthcare startup and kind of getting a little bit, you know, disenfranchised with how tech was working as is. And that seemed like a new kind of utopian model of what it could maybe look like. And mm -hmm. to not at least try to go work on that seemed like a bit of a waste. So definitely wanted to just jump anyways. So you joined Coinbase in 2018, right? That's right. Yeah. And you started off as an intern, from what I from what I understand, at Coinbase. I did, Commerce. yeah, yeah. So I started off as an intern. It was really strange because I had been working full time as a software engineer at a different startup in Canada, but because I hadn't had a degree or hadn't finished my college yet, I applied as a full time engineer, went through that whole process, and then as we were like kind of talking about the the job offer, they realized that I didn't actually have my degree to go join full-time so <laughs> decided to do the contract or the the intern route and then uh from that internship kind of contracted for the next few months while i kind of blitz finished my degree so i could come back down full-time again why did you feel the need to drop out of college um i had done this a couple of times honestly oh really <laughs> okay so i'd originally gone to college to study architecture um and that was kind of the thing that i wanted to do um through that architecture kind of coursework, I did a computer science course and just kind of fell in love with the like the lack of limits of kind of like non meat space infrastructure. So if you can just build without any physical limitations, it got way more interesting mm. to me. So then I you know dropped out of college again, switched into computer science, came back into that, um, and started working through computer science courses, uh, getting a job just as a you know software engineer at a local tech startup in British Columbia. Mm -hmm. um, and then once again, it, it, dropping it almost felt like a muscle memory at that point. School was almost like a means to an end versus the experience itself um, for me. So it was pretty straightforward for me to drop out, given the fact that something so compelling 
was right there that I could just do without school, or at least so I thought without school. When when you joined uh, Coinbase Commerce, what was that like as an intern? Um, and did you spend your off times building other projects, or were you just like you just I want to I want to kick ass in this so that I, they can hire me full time? Like, what was your what was your thought process during that time? It was incredible. Um, it was the first like true Silicon Valley startup that I had worked at. I think Coinbase was about two hundred people at the time, which was still the biggest company I'd ever been at. But this still very small, very incredible culture team of people who were super driven with the idea of what crypto could do for civilization. So when I started at commerce, I was living in this really, really tiny apartment in San Francisco that almost made me never want to go home. <laughs> um, so I just ended up basically working like dawn till dusk um, every day in that office, um, mainly on Coinbase things. But the, the intern class that we had, everyone that was working there was equally as driven. So we ended up with this kind of incredible serendipity of a group of people who all wanted to build cool things together. Um, and that mm. network is still very, very strong today, I think. Do you, do you remember the first thing you sort of got tasked to do at Coinbase Commerce as an intern? Yeah, my manager, um, Maxim, who's incredible and like still, I consider him a, a really good mentor today. Uh, he basically made me read three books before I was allowed to kind of touch the code uh, at Coinbase. Oh wow! Which was which was a great great experience. Um, so I basically had to like uh, leading up to the first few weeks of my internship, I had to like crush these three books. I don't think he was actually making me read all three of them, but he highly suggests that I finish them, and kind of that sparked the whole experience at Coinbase for me. What were the three books? Do you remember? Yeah, it was Anti-Fragile by uh, Taleb. It was The Sovereign Individual. And I want to say the third was Cryptonomicon. I'm not sure. I'd have to check that third one. Um, are those, the, those, are those the are those three books? Are, were those the three books that they made everybody read at Coinbase? Like it was like a cult, sort of like uh, like a biblical type of reading where it's like you have to align on these principles and we're all on the same page and then we can build. <laughs> I think... Maybe unintentionally that did end up happening, especially with okay. Cryptonomicon. I remember like you could walk through the office and see multiple copies on people's desks all over the place. It was like this little signal that you had. Um, but yeah, there was, a, there was definitely a bit of a shared reading list happening at Coinbase, I think. Wow. Okay. So you completed the internship, joined full-time. You were there for about three years, right? Post-internship, mm -hmm. what did you focus on? What did you do there? Um, so Coinbase Commerce at the time was like a really, really small group of people. I think there was mm -hmm. maybe six or seven of us and we were kind of like treated like the venture bet team of just like, let's just see if this works and if the product works, we can kind of expand on it. Um, but at the time it was like very much a struggle. I know that this has been kind of memed upon it so many times now, but the startup within a startup analogy really applied to that Coinbase Commerce team. It was just like, mm. we had a small dedicated set of resources and we were just trying everything we could to see what would work and what didn't work. Um, but the, the team that we had was incredible. It was like an amazing experience to be working with them. Yeah. There's a reason why I'm like diving so deep into like your early, early days. Reason is because I, I love what you guys are doing at Zora. I've been using the, the platform, of course, right? I've been minting my stuff on there, minting other people's stuff on there. And I think it's really well built and like really well executed. And just understanding like the boot camp, boot camp that you went through at Coinbase mm -hmm. to where you kind of got today is me sort of just tr trying to understand like what went into that process that then later got the three of you to sort of quit and start Zora, right? And like building that diverse yeah. skill set. You know what I mean? Walk me more through that story of like when you got to a point where like, all right, we've been here for a minute now. There's a lot of opportunity out there. Let's go do this thing. Like, is that how it went, went about? Like, am I thinking about this in a cinematic way <laughs> or was it less sexy? I think... Almost to an extent. It was strange because so uh, Jacob and Dee and myself, like we'd never worked directly with one another at Coinbase. We'd, you know, okay. worked together in a few hackathons or through random experiences, you know, happy hours, things like that. And we'd always be talking and just kind of sharing ideas. Um, but I think all of us kind of simultaneously came to this point at Coinbase as it grew from like, you know, two hundred to two thousand people. A lot of the like risk and reward that we had of just like, let's try this thing, it might not work, it might work started to disappear with these like more calculated bets, which I think was probably the right decision for Coinbase as it was growing. But for, you know, a lot of us who were there with this idea of like this moonshot mission, um, it started to like take away from that, that draw of building new things and experimenting with ideas. Um, so I think 
around that time, I just I remember seeing Jacob tweeting out the moon, sun, moon kind of bat symbol um, on Twitter. And I just had this hunch that Jacob was about to leave Coinbase. And I just wanted to see what he was getting up to. Uh, so we ran out for coffee, kind of shared this like big master strategy on Notion with me of all of these things that he wanted to do with this company called Zora that he was trying to start. And I guess it was from that point, I was just like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm going to leave too. <laughs> it was a very casual decision, I think. In retrospect, I probably should have put a bit more thought into it. But yeah, very much just, it seemed like the obvious thing to do when I just went with it. So do you remember what was written in that Notion doc? And I'm only asking because I'm curious how that sort of changed to where you guys are at today. Yeah, definitely. I think it's funny because I think we've come very much full circle on that original Notion doc. Um, the original idea was what happens if you put the creativity that creators have and allow them to actually collect the value that they create from their creativity. Um, we see a lot of like, you know, extractive models in a lot of these creator ecosystems today where it's very much about taking fees from creators and capitalizing on creators rather than allowing creators to actually capture that value. So we thought, what happens if we allow creators to capture the value of their creation? And then what happens if we allow these creators to build communities around these creations? Um, and what happens when those communities then become incentivized to help propagate those creations and expand, you know, the global network of public goods and public luxuries that exist up there. So this model of uh, empowering creators to capture the value that they create, that's obviously a direct sort of like, uh, like goal based off problems that have occurred in the past in the industry that sort of mm -hmm. prevents creators from capturing the value that they create. Can you sort of, can you sort of talk about that? Break that down for me because I think there's like this, there's this notion of like, we're going to own web three, like we're going to, we're going to capture this value, but like, what are we really missing here? Like what, what, what did we mess up on in web two that we're now making up for in web three that you kind of see from your point of view? Yeah, I think there's a few different ones, but the way that Zora started the original kind of solution that Zora proposed, um, we had this problem that we kind of called the easy problem, where a lot of creators like Kanye West kind of can create these limited set of runs that have huge cultural impacts, easy sneakers being one of them, where they say, okay, let's release 200 sneakers, all at $200. Once they get sold out, that's it. The problem with that is Kanye or creators like Kanye would only ever see that original $200 that they had sold. If those sneakers then were resold on secondary marketplaces at much higher prices, which they have been forever, they don't get to see any of that cultural impact and the value of that cultural impact being captured. So the original idea was what if creators could actually spin up a marketplace that allows for live prices of these physical goods and therefore be able to actually capture the increase or decrease of those prices over time. That was kind of the original idea. And I think we've been seeing this kind of expansion of that idea of just like what happens when creators have all the tools they would need to take their work and have all of the value be captured or collected by their community and stay within their community versus have these you know extractive fee models where a lot of the, the value of these creations is getting drained out to third parties that aren't actually participating in that creation process. So, what is it about Web3 that actually enables that? I think a lot of it is the the innate transparency and the exposure to serendipity you get from that transparency. So what I mean by that is when you bring a lot of these economic models and actions by communities and creators on chain, you end up with this kind of network of data that everyone can see and act upon. And when you allow people to act upon that in a permissionless way, you, you kind of allow this exposure to serendipity to increase where people can see these ideas working, expand on them, and continue to iterate on these like evolutions of how creation can be kind of valued through, through society in a little bit more of mm -hmm. a um, direct way. So when you see, you know, all of these ideas being experimented with and actually being able to see what the outcomes of these experiments are, you're able to expand and iterate and continually evolve these new mm -hmm. ideas further and further. Yeah. I remember in, I think it was, was it fortune that released like the, the initial article on Zora sort of talking about the easy problem, uh, highly highlighting RAC. And I remember in the very beginning, Zora was very much focused on like physical merchandise or at least mm -hmm. to an extent. 
And uh, it's 2022 now, and your marketplace has evolved tremendously from the API to different products that you guys sort of offer. And while you still focus on physical goods, right, with the Nouns Vision drop, which I ended up collecting, mm -hmm. um, there's also a focus on like the digital goods, right? Um, can you talk about sort of like the learning lessons that you sort of discovered along the way from the initial vision of what you sort of offered to what you guys offer now? Yeah, I mean, I guess the the end result is basically that we realized creation is creation. Any medium that it kind of is created through doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. um, the, the physical creations that we were helping sell were incredible. They were all like very beautiful artifacts of work from all of these creators that we've been working with. And they were very successful selling them. I think what we started to realize as a very small team who had primarily only worked in crypto, running like a full physical logistics business is very difficult and requires a lot of it's work not easy. that we didn't have experience with, right? <laughs> um, but like we've been talking about, you know, NFTs and the promise of purely digital media for a long time. And it seemed like a very natural step for us to just focus purely on digital creation and see where that gets us. And I think the thing to keep in mind with digital creation is there is no, nothing stopping the digital creation from transcending into a physical creation. There, that, that translation process is very simple to do, but it doesn't necessarily have to be us directly creating that. It would be mm. an extension of what we already built. So do you think all media will be tokenized in the future? I think it will, I think all media will have a, some level of provenance stored on chain, whether or not that's the media itself directly stored on chain or a reference to that media kind of remains to be seen, but it, it mm -hmm. makes sense for there to be provenance completely visible for everyone to see. So does that make like anything digital sort of worth collecting then? Like, you know, you know what in I mean? Way, like, 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 what, like, what's worth collecting? What's not worth collecting? And who are we to decide even? But I guess it's like yeah, an interesting I, conversation to have. I think what we start to see that gets really interesting, and we're starting to see it with this creator tool we put out, this idea of like a timed open edition. And what that basically means is like, there's no limit on the number of NFTs you can mint in this time period, but you have to mint within that time period to be a collector of this item. And what that kind of has sparked is this new form of provenance where it's like you marking like I was here for this moment in time and I saw this get minted. And that's a very special moment versus like being one of 10,000 people that were able to collect this over time. It's like I was here at this moment in time and I've marked my spot. Um, and that form of provenance is net new that we haven't really been able to see in art collecting at all before. Um, so all of the actions that you do on chain kind of form this character or this identity of your portfolio or of your you know online identity entirely. I think that's very interesting. So on that same thought, okay, there's also a lot of marketplaces sort of built on top of Zora, right? Which is like the bread and butter of what Zora does. Um, a lot of the marketplaces that I sort of love and adore and collect on and love supporting and also featuring artists on the podcast are sort of like built on Zora. So on this premise of being able to, to collect everything, what are some marketplaces or platforms that you have yet to see sort of be created in Web3 that you actually want to see kind of like, uh, I guess, be birthed? That's a really, really good question. Um, I think we've yet to see, uh, th there's been this like common theme of like realizing the, the potential of CC0 and completely open source media and works. But along the same veins of like the value of the provenance of these NFTs, what we haven't really seen yet is a group or a community that's focused on the actual archiving of already existed public domain items. So things like the first images from the James Webb Space Telescope, for example, that are CCO, mm. and actually like archiving these these works into you know the the Web three domain or into the completely decentralized domain, such that they kind of will always exist there. Um, that's something that I think would be really really exciting to see. Just how far can you extend the archival process of the internet, or what has been created on the internet? Interesting. How would even how would one go by doing that? I imagine a nouns DAO style mechanism might actually be very beneficial there, um, where the you know the the main mission or the the reason of existence for this DAO would be to archive anything that is you know potentially archivable and kind of create this curated museum or gallery of mm. historical digital works. Okay. Interesting. 
I've yet I've yet to see what that would even look like. I'm trying I'm trying I'm trying to imagine like what, like okay, you we bring up the nouns now. Like okay, I get the action of like what that would look like as an end user, right? Or maybe as a community. But in the grand scheme of things, like if you were to start something like that, what would be the first few things that you would index? So space artifacts, okay. What else comes to mind? I think the like there are like <laughs> particular sets of images or moments in time on the internet where you kind of feel this gravitational pull, especially in places like Twitter or mm -hmm. I don't, I, I don't really use Facebook anymore. Yeah. But they're, they're, yeah. They're, yeah, exactly. There's that algorithmic pull towards certain memes or certain moments on the internet. And I think recognizing those patterns and seeing, you know, if there's enough signal on a certain topic or a certain subject, there there is a reason, I think, to archive that and mark that moment in time that we have hmm. yet to see. What would you pay for a space artifact, like an, uh, a, a collectible of like the, the telescope artifact or a, a moment in time um, is, is I think, would the prices range. I, I think what becomes kind of exciting there is the idea of like, rather than there being only one of those artifacts to exist, you use that model that we talked about earlier, of like an open edition where it's okay. Anyone who was at this moment in time can now mark their place and say, Hey, yeah, I hear I was here. I, was, I participated in this moment. Um, so rather than have like, you know, one large price, you say, maybe sell them each for a dollar and just like mm -hmm. pay a dollar to say that you were there. Um, but just like, I think something that gets very, very exciting. Um, we've been seeing it on our tool as well. We've had just in the last few months, like a quarter million of these open edition type mints where you say have a day or a few hours to actually mint this piece just to mark your moment in time. So how should be, how should creators be using like this new open edition format? I remember back in the early days, early days, about a year and a half, two years ago, when NFTs had like their, their moment, the nifty gateway era, there was a lot of discussions mm -hmm. around uh, diluting your value or the elements of scarcity. Right. Um, you're also seeing this today with like music NFTs, like how many editions should you release? Right. What's mm -hmm. considered rare? How, how do you do it in a way where you don't dilute your value on chain as a creator? Right. Mm -hmm. How do you think about that, that sort of like mental model at Zora? Yeah, I guess a way to look at it is maybe instead of looking at it as each individual piece having its own partitioned value, the collection as a whole has one large unit of value. So rather than one NFT being worth one ETH, you could say this collection of a thousand NFTs is worth a thousand ETH. And what's important there is rather than looking at these individual collectors as individuals, you treat the entire collection as a community. So if you were able to turn a collection of music editions into a community that can share these experiences together and actually work together as a, as a unit with this shared value of, you know, valuing this, this individual item, you might be able to actually activate a little bit more engagement or energy around the project that you're doing. Interesting. What are some examples that come to mind that have done this well? I think, I keep using nouns as an example, but it's been so interesting to me lately, but there are, there are groups of, I imagine very soon we'll start to see, you know, these edition type NFTs being treated almost as like a flag of the country where everyone who's a part of this group is now, you know, within this community or within this organization, mm. you could imagine like board apes or crypto punks, for example, when everyone, you know, sets their profile picture as a board ape or as a crypto punk, you are operating under the flag of the CryptoPunks or Board Apes project. If instead of Yuga Labs being, you know, the sole decider of kind of where that project can go, despite you actually having the individual rights to the NFT, that the project as a whole is still kind of controlled and run by Yuga Labs. If all of that, that, if that entire project was operated by the holders of that project, I think you start to see a lot more interesting spin-offs start to appear. And that's where I think like we've seen NASDAQ get really interesting where we've seen you know, a luxury fashion brand pop up right. Right now is being sent to space. There is like a cooking show with nouns. There's all sorts of just random serendipitous moments that start to happen when you have this community control, the entire mission of the project versus individuals that have created the spark for it. What, what have you seen like be your favorite moments, uh, throughout like the evolution of the nouns community and that you've sort of like learned yourself as a contributor and as a builder? I think one of the things that's been most interesting to me, um, Nouns Vision especially, but all of the like physical manifestations of the Nouns meme gets very, very interesting where you as a creator or artist can come to this community say, hey, I really like the flag or the, the brand or the meme behind what this community is doing. Here's my interpretation of how you could extend it. And if you look at Nouns DAO as like, 
the sole purpose of extending the meme of the nouns class is by attracting all of these creators into that meme, you're able to expand in all sorts of really interesting and unique ways that mm. we haven't really seen since companies like Red Bull, who have you know, one of the strongest marketing teams that exist. Do you imagine implementing those like those style of those tactics to sort of like growing Zora? Um, and if so, like how how would you plan on applying them? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that mechanism could work very well for something like Zora, where okay. we we built this like core infrastructure, right? The, the the core protocol we built is meant to be built on by everyone in whatever extension they can find. We like <laughs> there's really nothing too different about how Zora's protocol works from how the, the underlying nouns protocol works. What we don't have at Zora that like, you know, I would imagine we could see in the future is, is that community activation of being like, you are actively a member of the, the nouns DAO or the Zora DAO. Um, and in like, in being that member, having a direct input into the brand or creations that come out of Zora. Got it. Got it. Okay. A little shift from, uh, Nouns. I want to come back to it towards the end because we have some uh, questions on Twitter that I want to hit you with <laughs> as it pertains as it pertains to nouns and Zora. Okay, uh, but I want to also talk about Zoratopia. Um, I think in terms like in the scope of building a brand in Web three uh, in a world where things are so threatening and keywords are so scary and like just getting involved as a creator is very is very like overwhelming to be honest. Um, just having an open conversation about it, like it's hard to get involved. It's hard to overcome a lot of those barriers. But Zoratopia has kind of like proven to be a really cool outlet to meet like minded people. At least from the one that I joined. Right. Shout out to Latasha. It's a great event. Uh, you guys really curate it in a, in a really really fascinating way. And I think it's also allowed you guys to establish yourselves to have this like cultural presence in Web three that's sort of different from the rest. Um, can you can you talk more about that and more specifically like what is it like building for like the cool cultural user base but also like the top entrepreneurs and builders in the space like how how do you think about that as a builder? Yeah, I think I mean first of all like this entire project all of Zortopia is very much the brainchild of Latasha like all credit goes to her for what has come out of that it's been incredible. I think the the core thing that's really exciting there is just like web3 inherently is a very complex and scary place to be just like when people first started using the internet like it is dark and kind of creepy and there's all sorts of weird individuals there but if you start to open up that space of you know it's here are actual use cases and here are things that we are starting to see that get very exciting and make that accessible to way more people you kind of engage a much wider audience of people that can bring much more interesting things to the space if you if you limit the type of individual can enter the space, you end up with the same things being created over and over and over again. The original versions of Ethereum were all like super high, like hyper financialized products because it was very easy for financialized people to get an idea of what Ethereum can do. Now with Zoratopia, if we start to like explain what creative types can do and what's mm -hmm. possible to be created with Ethereum, we're able to bring creative archetypes into Ethereum and have creative ideas be brought into the space. I think in general, the more types of people you can attract to a new technology or a new solution, the more exciting and more different approaches to building things kind of arise on the internet. Mm. I think with that also comes the hackathons that you guys put together uh, digitally alongside ETH Global and also your own hackathons. And I was told you also spearhead that, right? And sort of like producing them and, and bringing them to life. Maybe not like like actually producing them, but... A lot of like the challenges or the, the developers that come through obviously have much of a value add for Zora. Can you talk more about the, the Zora hackathons that you guys put together um, and what that means in the grand scheme of things? Yeah, I mean, very similar to Zoratopia. It's the idea of like, mm. if we show people what's possible to be built and allow them to start building on top of it, we get all sorts of exciting ideas that we can start to help build on as well. So in the same way that Zoratopia introduced a lot of musicians and a lot of creators into the Power of Web3 the idea with the hackathons is like introduce garage band hackers like I was, like everyone else at Zora is, um, into like what's possible with these like very simple tools that we provide. At the mm -hmm. end of the day, Zora's protocol is pretty simple. It is like tools to buy and sell NFTs, it's tools to create NFTs, it's tools to create communities. Like those are very simple atomic units that can be used by anyone. How how hackers or how developers are able to use those is entirely up to them. 
And that leads us to all sorts of crazy and insane ideas that we get to see through these hackathons that always excites us and gets us like kind of set up for what we can be building next. What are some of the more exciting projects that have come out of, out of these hackathons um, and have any sort of continued and are continuing to build till today? I think my favorite one that comes to mind right now is uh, a Spores Vision. I don't know if you've seen the Spores DAO um, pop up. No, but I haven't. Effectively, it, it takes music NFTs and turns them into STEM players online that you can actually like mm. remix and mix and match with. They get really, really exciting, and it's a really, really cool site. Um, I can send you a link to that. Yeah, send me send me a link afterwards. Yeah, that's really interesting. Okay, so but Spores. We've been, we've been seeing all sorts of cool ones like that. Okay. A anything else that comes to mind? Um, I mean, obviously, catalog the like that the, the music NFT marketplace right. was one of the original hackathons we did. Was how was catalog being spun up out of that? No way. Um, yeah, I think just seeing the number of companies that have started from Azora Hackathon and actually gone on to raise around and become a real team and a real company has been really really exciting to see. Um, wow. What are, what are some of the more like exciting projects or problems for you right now in Web3 to solve? Like, okay, you're focused on the creator economy at Zora, but you seem like a very intellectual person. You spend a lot of time, a lot of your time thinking about the space. And one of the biggest issues, like challenges of being a, found, a founder is like staying focused, right? Because there's always new things to work on and problems to solve. Do you encounter that yourself? And if so, like what problems do you think you would also be working on if it wasn't for Zora? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think... The nature of like what we're trying to build with like the concept of hyperstructures is that it's a lot more akin to building hardware than it is software. And what I mean by that is if we ship something, it is final. And once once it's on the production line and being shipped out, we can't go ahead and change it anymore because people are now actively building on top of it and we just have no way of updating. So there's this everlasting tension between doing what we think is right in the moment and doing what we think will last as public infrastructure that can be extended and built upon it gets very difficult and that's kind of like i guess one of the biggest challenges of building things with zora is just that act of making sure that it's as open as possible for creation but also immediately useful for people um at the moment we release it so this concept of hyperstructures is it a meme or is it actually is it is it like it's a legit thing <laughs> it's absolutely both <laughs> okay <laughs> <I> think, <laughs> All good things tend to be memes anyways. Um, right. What What is a hyperstructure? Can we start with that? So a hyperstructure is basically a, you can kind of imagine it as infrastructure for the internet. And what I mean by that is it's, it is a tool that is completely open. It is free and it is valuable. So when it's open, that means that anyone is able to build whatever they want on top of it. They can use the tool however they see fit. Um, it's free, meaning there is no cost to maintain it where you know, public infrastructure in the real world has maintenance costs and has upkeep costs. Because this is deployed on Ethereum and completely uncreatable, once it's deployed, it's there forever and will work forever for as long as Ethereum exists. Um, and then finally, it's valuable, meaning that despite it having no maintenance costs and usually not taking a fee um, at the transaction level or any sort of extractive fee, there is a way to capture value from, from the hyperstructure. Um, and the way that that can be done is kind of this like threat of a fee where it's like there may be no fee for the infrastructure as it exists today, but there's always the optionality of turning on a fee later. And we see that with like a protocol like Uniswap, for example, have this kind of built in where there is a fee built into Uniswap that's just never been turned on. And it's actually, you know, the incentive of the holders of Uni token or the participants of the Uni DAO to make sure that fee does not get turned on because you want that infrastructure, that core infrastructure of the internet to stay free. But the value of having the control of that fee becomes very valuable. How do you, you monetize? Yeah, go 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 ahead. Continue, continue. Um, I was just going to say, you, you could imagine that, like, if you had the key to charge everyone in, I don't know, everyone in New York to use the subway. Like, if you were, okay. if you had the the key to be able to set the fee for the New York subway, that's a very valuable key to have. So, what you can do is kind of incentivize the riders of the new york subway to have a ownership share in that key to keep that fee as low as possible so you would have this kind of tension between speculators who would want to increase the fee to make more revenue and users who would want to keep that fee as low as possible kind of continually wanting ownership in that key and the same thing works for 
things like Uni, where you have speculators mm. who want to earn a fee on Uni, and you have users of Uni who want to make sure that fee stays as low as possible. And that tension is where that value starts to arise. Mm. So how do you monetize a hyperstructure? So in the case of Uniswap, there's different ways to monetize, but I guess in, in the, the Zora protocol-esque format, okay, how does that look like at scale? Like, what does that look like at scale? And how do you monetize something like that? I would argue you do not need to directly monetize a hyperstructure. Okay. And what I mean by that is, in the same way that I mentioned, the, the ownership of the, the fee switch for that hyperstructure is very valuable. You might choose to monetize by selling ownership rights in the entity that holds that fee switch. So you could have, for example, a hyperstructure deployed that, I don't know, does something anything, literally anything, you could then create a, I don't know, noun style DAO, for example, that every day mints one more person into the ownership group of that fee switch. And the, the monetization of the, you know, the, the way that that value kind of, kind of compounds into the, the current holders of that is by allowing one more member to buy into this group every single day, you're continually compounding a treasury on top of the, mm. on top of the tool. So that was one of the questions from the audience. Like, what do you think about the nouns model as a potential mechanism for open hyperstructure development? I think you can guess who that came from too. <laughs> that was definitely a Jacob tweet. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, of course that would be very, very in line with Jacob's recent thinkings. Um, yeah. I think the, the idea there basically is like the nouns down mechanism is extremely interesting as of late, just because it's one of the first kind of DAO constructs that aren't predicated on having fees being earned from a protocol where, you know, a lot of other DAOs that exist, most other DAOs, I'd say the value of ownership of those DAOs is because there's fees happening on their protocol where it directly relies on some form of extractive fee model to bring value directly to that DAO. The nows DAO model, if it worked with a hyperstructure would mean you're not actually extracting fees. You're just selling the right to turn on a fee in the future over time. And that gets very interesting and is a small nuance, but it's an important one because you're not buying into this DAO with the expectation that you're getting an extractive fee, which actually puts you against a user of the protocol. It's you're buying into the ownership of this DAO to be a participant in the expansion of this protocol, where you want more and more users of this protocol to exist because you want that tension to continue to exist of that thread of the fee. So why should creators care about this? Like why should creators give an F about hyperstructures? So from a creator level, I think one of the most important things about a hyperstructure is that it is infrastructure that you can build on top of and know that it will work the way it's worked forever with no changes. A lot of code on Ethereum is completely upgradable. And that right. means that you could choose to build on top of it, but at any moment, the owner of that code could change it and could completely alter how it works without telling you about it or without asking for your permission. A hyperstructure is effectively like being given a hammer or a piece of hardware and allowing you to use it however you want for as long as you want, because we have no permission. We have no way of changing it from underneath you. Hmm. Interesting. So I feel like it's going to be one of those things where it's just obscured underneath the surface. Like you, you'll never even know you're using it. You'll never know it's there, but it's there. And it's the reason why you're here is because it's there. Exactly. Uh, just like I mentioned, like infrastructure for the internet, you, you right. probably won't think you're using it, but it's very important that it does exist and that it, you know, stays there. So there has to be a way to capture value somehow. Like you're not just going to build to build, right? Okay. Like, sure. There's, there's an element of that, right? but you still need to find a way to capture value, right? Capturing the value that you create. How do you capture the value you create through a hyperstructure? What does that look like? So, so as a creator or as a, as Zora? I guess as, as Zora and as a creator. Yeah. So as a creator, I'd say you can quite safely just use the hyperstructure and build whatever fee mechanism on top of that, that you would like, if you want to capture okay. value. Okay. Like for example, one of the hyperstructures we've built, with our with our code is a, a way to sell nfts so you would just use that tool the the sales module that we built into our protocol to sell nfts and directly capture value from the nfts that you're selling got it the aside for zora's perspective on like how zora captures value from that is pretty 
straightforward as well as we can sell NFTs as well. We can use our tools building our own models or building our own ideas that we think would be interesting. Um, the, we're very, very much into dog booting our own products. And Got it. Like, it is very easy for us just to use the hyperstructures we've built to be like to capture our own values. Got we it. have one of the like one of the best content marketing or like artist groups that we could possibly have come together on the internet in Zora. And allowing us to use our own tools is, you know, very important for us. Yeah. I want to I wanna shift the conversation to talk more about data, on-chain data. Um, and as I say that, I see you smiling too. So I'm, I'm assuming you, you, you like this topic. So I know Web3 has a metadata problem. Um, can you quickly break it down and then how you could possibly, like how, how, how you would propose essentially to solve it? I, I guess, so I, I'll say one of the reasons that I like on-chain data uh, when it comes okay. to the metadata problem is very much in the same way that I like hyperstructures. Um, hyperstructures are very valuable because you know that it's going to work forever for as long as Ethereum exists, so too will the hyperstructure. If you bring data on chain and ensure that that data cannot be changed, you're doing the same thing. You're ensuring to every, every future user or every future interactor of that media or of that data that it's not going to change. It will exist there forever. But there's really no way to censor or to remove that kind of media. Got it. Okay. So with that being said, um, how would you sort of propose we solve like, how do we create a standard where everybody follows and that everybody's aligned with? And of course, I guess like the, the most obvious answer is like, if you all build on Zora, then we all we all sort of went to an extent. But in the grand scheme of things, like one, I want to be, I want to be optimistic. Let's say that's going to happen. Okay. Um, how do we solve that problem though, in the grand scheme of things for all marketplaces to align on the same data standards um, and for it to scale accordingly? I mean, it's it's almost like a paradox. I think I don't. Do you follow XKCD the the comics? I don't. No, I don't. So there's XKCD is this incredible like set of comics basically. But there's there's one panel that always sticks out where it's like we we've, we've solved we've created a protocol to solve all of the problems of these other protocols, and then like five years later, it's like oh, we created another <laughs> protocol to solve all of those other protocols. <laughs> um, and I think like I imagine that will continue to happen with you know archival media, like these ideas of how we can archive media and archive data online. Um, there is likely always going to be iterations and evolutions such that we can't have the single be all end all of what these protocols look like. But we can kind of work together to have, you know, one for the immediate term and one for the near term. It's just likely that that, that protocol or that, that method will continue to evolve over time as, you know, new forms of media start to arise. Got it. Got it. So as a, as a creative entrepreneur, for those who are creating content, those are tokenizing their, their art, their craft. Okay. Um, I think one of the biggest benefits of being a web three native creator is one, you get a, you get to build in an ecosystem. That's I think the most exciting and the most innovative ecosystem that has sort of like evolved in our time in our lifetime. But two, what's even more interesting, you're kind of like, you're building a new medium for you as a creator to understand who your audience is. Uh, and to to sort of build a community on, online that can never be shadow banned, right? The, the blockchain can never shadow ban you. Um, and I think a lot of what Web2 creators transitioning into Web3, they need to understand that. They need to understand that concept where when you build an audience on chain, there's all this data that you sort of can tap into that you can sort of become a better creator, a smarter creator, right? I'm curious from your point of view, like what does it mean to be like a data informed creator, right? It's just like, I, I feel like a lot of creators aren't there yet to an extent, but it's it's like one of these, like, it's like the, the gold in the blockchain that will allow a lot more creators to be better creators, smarter creators. You know what I mean? What what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think, uh, I, I don't think it's the default of the creator that we haven't seen that be utilized yet. And I think a big reason mm -hmm. for that is the act of actually getting that data and being able to find patterns and find, you know, different methodologies is very hard right now. We, we know the data exists and it is all there, but the act of actually extracting that data is very difficult. And like, I, I think that'd be something that'd be incredible for people to do. And people do on, you know, things like Doom dashboards and things like that, try to like right. all these different scenarios. But the reality, like the data is there, it's just not accessible yet. Um, so as that data becomes more and more accessible with different dashboards or different extraction methods, I think we'll start to see all sorts of really cool evolutions form as people can see, you know, what's worked, what hasn't worked, especially with different types of collectors or different types of communities mm. um, that'll get interesting. How do you guys use data at Zora as a, as a platform founder? 
to better understand the people minting on your site, to better understand who your users are, to better understand your community. How do you guys use on-chain data uh, to better inform yourselves? Yeah, I think we, we actually almost only use on-chain data. Uh, other than a few minor analytical things, we, we don't track anything about our websites or how people are using them right now. We're, we're very explicitly just tracking what's working on-chain. And that's important for us because really that's what matters is what actual transactions are happening mm -hmm. with our protocol or with protocols around us that we think are interesting. Um, so we have, you know, this incredible indexer that we've been using to kind of track and predict what's happening that we finally started to open up through this API we've released um, that allows us to make these predictions and like understand what's happening around Ethereum right now. Um, yeah. So we, we largely use it just to track the status of the on-chain transactions that are happening, which we yeah. think are kind of the most important metrics for any crypto company. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. All right, as we uh, as we sort of wrap up, I want to ask you uh, a couple more questions. Okay, so what do you wish you knew more about? In general, yeah, in general, because you seem you seem like a very informed person. Okay, you seem like you you like you know your shit, like you know what you're doing in crypto, but. You also, I also feel like I get the impression from you that you spend a lot of time thinking about the space. Um, and I'm curious, like, what do you wish you knew more about? I think if I were to go back five, oh, how long have I been in crypto for? A long time now. Uh, okay, let's say 10 years ago. Okay. I really wish I knew more about the fundamentals of cryptography and decentralized networks such that we could see the evolutions of things like how proof of stake is working, how ZK Starks and ZK Snarks are working, all of these like new core fundamentals underneath these blockchains that actually allow them to work. I really wish I understood more about that and had more of a grasp on that, which I, I'm working towards, but you know, it's just, it's not there yet. Um, and the reason I think that's really exciting is because in the same way that we see, you know, new collection or NFT mechanisms for different communities, I, I really want to see new protocol mechanisms built on different chains that, can't be done on how Ethereum is today, for example. Um, I, I think that's something that I, I really wish I knew more about. Um, it, as you sort of like jump down that rabbit hole, anything sort of come to mind that sort of fits in, in that line of thinking? Um, yeah, I think like, for example, there's this, you know, new technology called Starkware um, that allows for a, a, effectively like a hidden blockchain where you can, you can have these transactions that are done all at once, but not immediately visible. Um, and what that would allow for from, you know, a protocol standpoint is all sorts of new, interesting mechanisms that we can't have with Ethereum yet. Um, in the same way that Ethereum is extremely valuable because everything is so transparent, it's probable that there's equally valuable things from completely non-transparent data that can be done on chain. Um, mm. And I, I really want to see like what the inverse of Zora's could look like. Um, if you take the fact that everything is not transparent and put it on chain, what could be created through that as well? Okay. Okay. All right. Another question. I'm going through the, the Twitter replies. Let's see. Um, we already got the nouns one. There's another one that comes through. Um, all right. What was the biggest challenge when building the Zora protocol? Um, I think the hardest thing that we've always had to deal with is the fact that, like I said earlier, this is very much shipping hardware um we can't change what we've built and we always have this tension and these like really really intense debates about what needs to be in the core version of what we're trying to build it's really easy for us to try to build things that feel like they would make a lot of sense in the way we're seeing you know the environment of crypto right now but the reality is we often have to peel that back with the understanding that we need to be building for the very very long term with these core infrastructure that we're building so it's important that what we build is meant to be built on and not perfectly curated for one use case. Um, and I think that's the biggest challenge that we're like consistently facing. It's like, what is good enough to be the core pure version of what we're trying to build? Can you elaborate? You keep saying hardware. Is that because once you push something out, like there's no going back? Is that why you reference it as hardware? If you ship, I don't know, I have these AirPods right here. It's like when these AirPods get shipped out, Apple has no way to update the hardware right. or like the, the circuit board that exists here. So if I ever have a better idea of how this should be built, I, I can't change that for my users. Like, mm. um, at least speaking from Apple, right? So for us at Zora, it's like when we release this protocol and developers start to use it, 
we can't just say, okay, here's V2, everyone's now using it. We need to create a V2 and make it compelling enough that a developer would want to switch their work onto that V2. Because the understanding of these hyperstructures is that they will exist forever. And there's really no need to switch unless there is something absolutely more compelling on a version two or a version three. So it comes to that like N plus one version that gets much more difficult for us, where Got all it. of the future iterations have to be extra compelling. How do you incentivize teams to switch once they've already built their entire stack on uh, an older version? I, I, like I said, I think it has to be extremely compelling, um, the okay. versions that we created. Uh, <laughs> and like, in all, in all fairness, there's, there's really no need, like, if there's no reason to, um, if a version one of a product that we put out is working for everyone, they should continue to use it. Um, it it's never going to change. We can't do anything about it. They should continue to use it. And that's kind of the whole point of them. Okay. Um, but for, you know, future users or people that haven't started building on Zora yet, then, you know, maybe it makes sense to use the version twos or the version threes for what we put out. All right. Last question. This one comes from Richard, Richard intern. <laughs> how, how can the team manage magnificent meme game with top tier tool software development? <laughs> uh, I think uh, I really love the fact that we've kind of organically had this perfect duo of like somewhat put together at our Zora and then absolutely chaotic energy at Zora engineering. And that, that duo and that tandem seems to work really, really well together. Um, but Gem and Max running the Zora engineering Twitter. It's just, they're just killing it. All right. Amazing. Wait, I, now that you, uh, now that you answered that another question sparked up. All right. This is the last question. Okay. Um, Zora's brand is very unique, uh, from a design point of view. I know you're the CTO, but if you have some insight, what was the, what did the mood board look like when sort of designing Zora? It's actually funny you mentioned that because the original mood board for Zora was completely built by a community. So we actually just tweeted a Twitch stream and a Figma link and just allowed anyone to dump anything they wanted into our Figma board. And that was the original mood board for what Zora's brand was going to be. Um, we were just running a Twitch stream and dumping cool images into Figma until we kind of reached the Zora mood board. Wow. Um, yeah. Did that give you guys a lot of traction uh, when kickstarting Zora? I think so. Yeah. I mean, we wanted to build in the open from the very beginning and rather than, you know, build a product from the very beginning, we needed the brand to go with the product. So we were building mm -hmm. the brand completely in the open from the beginning. Um, and that mm -hmm. led to all sorts of really cool engagement and all sorts of, you know, <laughs> incredible creators and users of Zora from the beginning. Mm okay. Tyson, this was great. Thank you for being on. Before I let you go, where can we find you? Where can we find Zora? Shill it away. For sure. I mean, as we talked about, I think at the beginning, I'm quite covert online, but I think yeah. I'm still pretty active on Twitter um, at T T B T S T L. More covertness, basically. <laughs> um, and then obviously, yeah, Zora is a very pro Twitter place. So we are cool. always on Twitter. Amazing. Thank you so much for being a part of the season. Thank you for being on. We'll have to do this again soon. For sure. Thank you for having me.